lot of people don't see the connection that they have to wetlands, but every individual that lives in the prairies has a connection to wetlands. Wetland management policy is part of good watershed management policy. Every one that goes away adds to the nutrients that go downstream, adds to the, the impacts that we have due to flooding. It's been basically a free-for-all for drainage where one person drains onto the next guy and then he's forced to push it onto the next guy. You cannot dump on a neighbor. You can't drain every swamp and every slough and everything onto your neighbor. It's just, it's unethical. Do we just sit here and spin in a circle or do we do something? We need to find solutions to make it financially equitable for those farmers to keep those wetlands on their property. This program is funded by a grant through Ducks Unlimited Canada and by the members of Prairie Public. The biggest challenge that we have to the wetlands today is, is driven by a push for agricultural production. When the water is held in the wetlands on the landscape, those areas aren't conducive to growing crops and so the you know, the market signal to producers is to get rid of those wetlands. The challenge comes in that there are lots of, of downstream effects on other people when that happens. The Prairie Pothole region, the northern extent would be um, near Edmonton, Alberta, and then it runs south all the way to historically into, into Iowa. So a, a pretty big geographic area, about 300,000 square miles in whole and um, the distribution of it between Canada and the U.S. is about two-thirds of that region in Canada and about a third on the U.S. side of the border. Wetlands provide a tremendous number of benefits and, and that's one of the things that we're trying to understand here through our research at Ducks Unlimited. We're studying the impacts of, of wetland loss on water quality, flood mitigation, uh, carbon sequestration. A lot of people are looking at uh, Mother Nature and the incredible amount of rain, high moisture content, the El Nino event, all of the climactic changes that are happening. And that's certainly given us a lot of water. But it's because we can't deal with the water effectively that's causing all of the damage right now. So much of the agricultural land has been drained, sloughs and natural drainage. We haven't got a good dike system in place, dam system to retain the water anymore. Yes, you can blame it on Mother Nature, but uh, people have had a real impact on how we've dealt with all of this excessive water. One of the things that, that makes this area so unique is the diversity of wetlands that we have. So they're, you know, we really classify them based on the, uh, their depth and how long they hold water. So we have very temporary wetlands that may only be a couple of inches deep, hold water for a couple of weeks in the springtime, and then we would move to seasonal wetlands that would hold water after runoff through May or early June in a typical year. A little deeper wetlands would be semi-permanent ones that would hold water throughout most years but dry up during some of the dry periods and then the more permanent wetlands would be typically what we think of as lakes that would only go dry during the most extreme drought period. We're concerned about all types of wetlands but probably it's fair to say that Ducks Unlimited is more concerned about the small temporary seasonal wetlands. Those are the ones that are more easily drained by agriculture producers or other developers across the province. So it's trying to retain those small seasonal wetlands that play a very, very important role, biological role, with waterfowl when they're migrating and when they first arrive in the spring prior to nesting. That's the main food source for ducks and waterfowl and other wildlife. We continue to lose wetlands. They're, they're whittled away every year and, and those impacts add up every pond that goes away is one less out there that's available for a pair to set up on and breed on and, and produce young from. But also every one that goes away adds to the nutrients that go downstream, adds to the impacts that we have due to flooding. I'm concerned about maintaining and preserving wetlands because they are the key to life in the prairies as we know it. They protect an awful lot of drinking water sources. They store an awful lot of carbon that uh, helps mitigate uh, climate change. They produce a myriad of waterfowl and wildlife uh, that come out of them. And the recreational and intrinsic value of them in people's everyday lives are very important. 
small wetlands have a great storage or what we sort of refer to as a as a sponge ability to hold water in the spring and store that water and minimizing the, the flow off of the land into streams and into rivers causing downstream floodings. Beyond that, uh, wetlands play a very important role in recharging groundwater. So there's a whole array of benefits and values that they provide to society at large beyond that of, of habitat for waterfowl and wildlife. You can think of prairie wetlands as mini bathtubs on the landscape. They really catch water and the nutrients in that water and they usually hold them there and discharge them slowly and put them into plant material and into sediment material. When you drain that wetland you expose all that material to, to air which increases the rate of decomposition so the next time water comes in contact with it it saps all those nutrients away and essentially brings them downstream into the next body of water. So all these nutrients and water moving off the landscape go somewhere. And so they can go into local drinking water reservoirs and turn into algal blooms. They can, they can wind up at your local beach where you want to go swimming and turn into algal blooms. And so those have some, some negative consequences. Uh, Blue-green algae can produce toxins. Uh, and there's other water quality issues that are associated with flooding and the transport of these nutrients across the landscape. From the onset of, uh, of, of our ranching operation, we decided that we would preserve the wetlands. Having wetlands on, uh, on the ranch do pay off in times of, of drought or low moisture. We have experienced years where we, we see a bumper uh, crop of forage in a ring around the wetland because of that moisture is, is there, it's available to plants and plants utilize that. So, we do see a bump up of, of forage production around the intact wetlands. The gray area is what constitutes a wetland that would stay a wetland and what constitutes an area that stores water there for part of the year. If the land would go dry in June, you know, a week, two weeks after, three weeks after you finish seeding, those ones they say, I'd rather drain those. But I mean, if they're wetlands that are, mar and there's marshes and deep sloughs here that never should be drained. The market tells a, a landowner to drain that wetland and plant canola. It doesn't tell him to save that wetland and sell that water quality benefit. Farmers are driven by these market pressures and we need to work with them to figure out how we can get them to conserve and restore more wetlands by looking at the amount of drainage that's occurred over about a 40 year period. And what we found is that there is uh, approximately 70% of the wetlands have been drained. So that means that those wetlands have a physical man-made drain on them and the water that once was captured in those wetlands is now leaving those wetlands, moving to ditches, into streams and then uh, down into our lakes. Farmers are getting rid of some of these wetlands for a couple of reasons. It's convenience as well as its uh, economics. Uh, you can bring a little bit more land into production and so that's always better for your bottom line. They're also, these small wetlands are a bit of a nuisance to go around and equipment's getting bigger and bigger and it costs them money to go around them so it's a lot cheaper and easier to go through them. Economic can be part of it but I think even a bigger suasion now is the uh, bigger equipment and the efficiencies of turning and we, we have a concept now, a GPS, uh, Global Positioning Systems in Agriculture, which automatically will steer your tractor down the field. Won't automatically yet steer it around the pothole, but it will steer it from one end of the field to the other. So there is a bit of a suasion to say, I would like to go in straight lines. Industry will lead it to us that you have to have a 60-foot air drill, gps and you need nothing in your way mega drainage to drain all this water to create clear running paths for large farm equipment right now. Along with the wetlands and everything, our trees are disappearing at an enormous rate here also, which goes hand in hand with wetlands. The progress has been gradual. It's been at least 35, 40 years. We've been seeing a more dramatic uh, increase in the volumes picking up in the last two decades. I believe it's due to the equipment that's now available. There's, you know, probably I uh, imagine a magnitude of about eight or ten times the amount of sloughs that weren't meant to be coming in this water system that are now coming down here. Farmers get, are getting bigger, the machinery's getting bigger, but it's important that we maintain those wetlands. Uh, they serve as recharge areas, they're, they're there for our, our wildlife. 
There's nothing wrong with farming around a pothole, and that's my opinion. Drainage is one of those things that are like everything in life. They're, it's not all negative, and it's not all positive. And I think what we're talking about in terms of the context in Manitoba is whether there are areas that drainage would be more appropriately not done because it has some other advantages. You know, I thought it was ironic that they should be digging holes in eastern Manitoba to store water to irrigate potatoes, and in western Manitoba we're digging ditches to drain holes. My major concern right now is the continual drainage of pothole type wetlands in southwestern Manitoba. Uh, they store a, an amazing amount of water and an amazing amount of nutrients and even though some of them are protected by policy by the provincial government, there's still uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of them that are unprotected and are being drained uh, as we speak today. The people who are up upstream, uh, they, uh, they're happy. They get rid of their water and it's gone and so they think, what's the problem? There's people downstream that are affected by their, by their decisions. And unfortunately here in Saskatchewan, we've had a free-for-all for drainage for decades. So it is creating situations where you've got one landowner pitted against another one, you might say, or certainly areas where they're being impacted by flooding and other areas where they're draining wetlands in order to have more acres available for annual cropping. There's the farmland upstream, you know, 50 miles, 60, 70 miles from us. Now we're draining every little pothole, ditch, uh, slough. Everything is being drained in, annually into these salt lakes, which are a huge concern to us. And they've raised the level 25 feet. Now there's some of that water that's uh, being drained upstream, not going to the salt lake, it's being diverted into uh, large sloughs upstream from us, and they're dumping into these lakes. It's a closed system. The water doesn't have anywhere to go. Our biggest issues regarding wetlands up in, in the area here and, and is sp spread over across the, other parts of the province now is getting rampant is illegal drainage. It's got rampant here in the last three years in a big time scale where we have lost marshland, wetlands. We're losing road infrastructure because of it because the water is not being held back and run off in a timely manner like it used to. It's coming at us like a wall now. The water is also moving uh, in volumes that it never moved before and because of that, that's causing flooding and economic hardship to businesses but also other farmers downstream. All this drainage from upstream by farmers is also impacting farmers downstream. We're seeing huge uh, sandbars and muck bars coming out the fields that we never used to have. We had to worry about eroding but we didn't have to worry about these huge sandbars and how do you seed? Like, these things don't dry up for you sometimes a year, eh? And then you're into the next spring and you don't dare do any work on the, on the land when it's fall time because it leaves it exposed for the flood coming up. So it makes it very hard to do the land work we used to do. My uncle, who was from Nova Scotia, an ag engineer from Nova Scotia, and his comment to me when I was young with regard to drainage was you're turning the place into a desert. The concept always was, let the other guy keep the water and I'll break the land, eh? It affects the water tables in those areas that they drain. Eventually, if they drain everything, they're gonna suffer towns and villages that drain in those areas, they don't have water. And if they don't leave those, those sloughs, at least in the wet years, leave them uh, fill, they're gonna have issues. They'll permit you to uh, take these little potholes and connect them to one of the big ones. If, 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 it's, if you're on your own land, that's allowable. The minute you start bringing that water off your property onto an RM right away or someone else's property, you must apply to Sask Water for a permit to do so. It's not happening right now. It's just gone. And the minute they dig an eight-foot ditch to drain that marshland, then it just creates problems down the road. And there's a process in place for appeals. And someone's supposed to come out and mediate this. Not happening. It sort of left it up in the air for us to fight in the court of law, neighbor versus neighbor now. We have things in place, let's use them. You put it into the hands of the province, they say they don't have enough money to hire enough staff to do it. Uh, so do we just sit here and spin in a circle or do we do something? 
there has to be some balance. And the way it's going now, this continual drainage is just taking away from, it's causing huge economic damage downstream and, and ruining the environment upstream. So it's insanity. Overnight, without no one even knowing, without no permission from council or, or adjoining neighbors or whatever, the fellow from across the road here didn't like the water in his land. So he just came here with a backhoe and dug, dug a road across and let the water go across. And that, that was it. And now we're faced with added costs and everything and ensuing possible property damage because of the flooding created just on where the water's being headed for. So this is only one of many in, in, in my RM that we're dealing with. Wetland drainage in Manitoba is really showing its ugly head in terms of economic impact this year. Uh, just about every municipality has roads that have blown out, culverts that have blown out, crossings that have washed out. We're seeing a loss of tourism dollars in provincial parks, loss of golf courses, loss of uh, a lot of access through the countryside. The effects on the, on the people that live around the lake is, is it's almost catastrophic. First five years I lived here, the, the water levels were stable. So you were able to put out a, a, a you know, sort of infrastructure of docks. In the past three to five years here, we've lost about 60 feet of lake shore, and we are unable now to be able to put our docks out there because it, it fluctuates so much. There used to be an environmental reserve, that's gone. There used to be a path that used to be in front of this, that's gone. It uh, is now consuming my property. We're now seeing people that, are, that have bought $100,000 properties unable to put basements in their uh, new homes. If we wouldn't have stopped the neighboring RM from holding the water back even further, we, these people were unable to build at all. So it's hurt the value of the property. It's been a huge uh, energy consumer because who wants to be fighting with their neighbors? I mean, we're left in a position to have to tell our neighbor not to flood us anymore and otherwise we suffer huge economic damage. We can't farm the land we want to. I can't do the fall tillage in the fall. I have to rely now on glyphosate and chemicals in the spring because you don't dare open that soil. And as much as uh, I'm a, in favor of zero till, it doesn't completely cover the ground. You still have spaces between the rows and every flood, some of that dirt gets washed away. It's a slow and gradual progression, but we are losing fertility in our soil. Our land is becoming devalued due to somebody else increasing his prospects by taking out sloughs. If farmers in western Manitoba don't put a crop in, that means that there's no harvest and that's not good for car dealers, that's not good for travel agents, it's not good for restaurants, it's not good for any of the economy in our city, let alone province-wide. It's, it's going to be uh, astronomical, the, the economic toll of this flood. The government has to start acting. They have to act. They, they have to take the moral and ethical position that you cannot dump on a neighbor. You can't drain every swamp and every slough and everything onto your neighbor. It, it's just, it's unethical. Wetland drainage is having all of these uh, effects on the environment and on, on flooding. And because of that, we really need to put policies in place and have incentive programs to make it financially equitable for those farmers to keep those wetlands on their property. The municipality I live in is Blanchard Municipality and Blanchard Municipality was involved in an ecological goods and services program as a trial project within the province. And what that meant was that they were paying producers to leave the trees as they were in terms of our, what we call bushes and the sloughs and the potholes as they were undrained uh, as wetlands. But it was the first time in my life that somebody paid me not to drain a slough or not to bulldoze down a bush. The rest of my life, the suasion had always been drain the slough. If it's not too deep a slough, you can grow grain in it, you make money. Uh, knock a bush down, you can turn it into farmland and, and make productive value out of it. Uh, we do pay taxes on those sloughs and bushes, not big taxes, but we do pay some. So they are a net cost to us in terms of our operation if we don't gain anything out of them. So uh, the ecological goods and services concept was the first time in my life that somebody was paying me do some of the, the actions that I normally would not have done. We've been asking, there are, there are farmers here, that if they set aside 20 acres and get compensated for it, that's our push, if someone would pay them a check each year, $15, $30 an acre for that 20 acres that they put aside, 
that would help. Right now they get no compensation, they get no just reward for leaving anything right now. So they're gonna, they'll, they'll totally destroy it right now. It'll be gone. I think the role of government in assisting with wetland conservation is to consider how we can update our current policy, make it more effective. I think the important part of that is to help better define uh, what wetlands are important and get a broader understanding of uh, what we want to save, where we want to save, and why, and what are the tools to do it. The tools might be policy, they may be looking and revisiting legislation, and the Ministry has an important role to play in terms of helping uh, facilitate new and improved incentive programs for private landowners and others interested in the conservation of wetlands and, and all habitats for that matter. I think that we need to do something along those lines that um, the large mega uh, flood protection projects like the Shellmouth uh, uh, Reservoir, like the floodway around Winnipeg, are good solutions but they're extremely expensive and they're limited. They don't have to be expensive, in fact uh, they can be very simple projects and again wetland management policy is part of good watershed management policy. The average person can do a lot to protect wetlands by first and foremost becoming aware of what their values are, second talking to their local politicians and their neighbors in around and just say that wetlands are a value to them and, and they value them. And then thirdly, if you have wetlands on your property, just don't drain them or you can do small restoration projects pretty, uh, pretty easily. In most cases, the wetlands that are drained are seasonal or temporary wetlands. They're only an acre or two in size. So if you can picture that, where there's a drainage ditch, a shallow ditch, of which that water moves out of that wetland, it's a pretty simple process, a relatively inexpensive process, to go back in there and, and put a small dike or, or ditch plug in that drainage ditch. And uh, the next spring, with spring runoff, that wetland would be full again of water and within two to three years the, the vegetation would restore its, itself as well. So probably in a three to five year period after restoration it's performing almost like it did prior to drainage as a naturally functioning wetland. Our ministry makes available a fair amount of funding each year to uh, non-government organizations to do habitat conservation in Saskatchewan and a lot of great work has, has resulted from that. There are a wide variety of groups out there that are interested in, in conservation and doing on-the-ground programs. And, and I can't understate the importance of on-the-ground work in the meantime while we solve some of the bigger uh, pieces of the puzzle. And certainly uh, individuals can be involved with those organizations, whether it be as a volunteer or as just providing funding to those folks so they can do on the ground programs, work with local landowners, private landowners on really positive things. For the province to implement a more effective wetland policy that has those regulations and really has a mechanism in place to enforce those regulations requires political will. Where does political will come from? It comes from public demand, public requesting government to make some changes in its policy, in its legislation, in its regulations, and in enforcement of those regulations. So the public have a very important role. Ducks Unlimited can't do it alone. We require the support of partners, and we especially require the support of public. If you can imagine uh, rolling back the clock to when, you know, the sloughs were on the land, that we hadn't done the uh, excessive amount of drainage, think of how much water we could have retained. People have to understand that we didn't have thousands of wetlands in, in the prairie pothole region here by accident. We didn't have a, these wetlands because we have summer. We have them because we have winter. We have five, maybe six months of, of snowfall accumulating and then when it melts, it goes away quickly. With everything being drained so quickly, these floods are, are going to keep occurring. What used to be a one in 50 or a one in 100 year flood will likely be a one in five or one in 10 year occurrence, unless the government is serious about restoring some wetlands. What's important is we'll see change in the policy if we see the appetite for that and, and the will for that from the public. And, and so what's key is that folks across these areas 
indicate that to their political representatives and say, look, we're tired of paying for flood damage and dealing with all the chaos that that causes and we see the benefits to keeping the nutrients on the landscape, we see all the biodiversity benefits out there. That's what we want as a society. We think that's important. I'm pretty confident that if that's the message the public sends, the, the political folks will respond to that and, and do what's right. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at www.prairiepublic.org and click on Shop. This program is funded by a grant through Ducks Unlimited Canada and by the members of Prairie Public.